Let's open in prayer and we'll get started. Lord Jesus, we are just grateful for your word. And it's so easy for us to let this world and our upbringing and our culture interpret what truth is for us. But tonight we just come and look to your word and want it to speak clearly to us to remove any presuppositions that we might have and that we would just look uh, anew at it just from what your word says. So give us understanding and Lord we don't want to um, let our minds go where, where they shouldn't, where things too deep or too um, difficult to understand at this point that we would wait on you and just trust and believe and know that these promises are sure. How and when aren't as, matter, as important as the matter that they are. And so let us just find encouragement in these promises tonight. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. amen. All right. The rapture is, I would say, probably one of the most talked about things within Christianity, especially prophetic teachings today. And there are all different kinds of things from pre-trib to post-trib to mid-trib to no-trib ideas. Um, what does that mean? Well, the tribulation we've talked about before in the seven-year period. And so the question is, is does the rapture happen pre-tribulation, before all, literally hell breaks loose on earth? In the middle of all of that, after all of that in the post-trib, or no trib, there just isn't any of it. <coughs> it's all symbolic. So all of those definitions of tribulation, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, etc., are based upon a westernized view of all of a sudden everybody's walking around and poof, we're gone. Our clothes are left behind. Uh, if you saw the Left Behind series, read the books, whatever, and now you're all with the Lord, and then there are some unlucky ones that are left behind. Well, that's nice, but that's not exactly what Scripture says. And there is a Hebrew understanding of a rapture that never seems to get put as one of the um, options to your understanding of this whole thing. So that's kind of what we want to look at here tonight. Um, one of the verses that we often hear coming from Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, is then we will, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together. And we all go, ooh, rapture. We're, if we're alive when the Lord comes, boom, we're going to be caught up to him with the Lord and we're going to remain with him forever. Now that's not all untrue, but it's a little misleading because let us take this in context of the rest of these verses. Because it continues and it says, or actually the prior verses say, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So, we have to have the whole context of this because what we're seeing is first, the dead in Christ, the, the, those that are in the graves, are going to resurrect the believers of the past who have died. And then, if you are alive still when this happens, then those people are caught up to the air. And you're going to be with the Lord forever. That's an important time there as well. And he says, let you know these words encourage us. Well, the word encouragement here is important. Because what is supposed to encourage you? It really isn't the rapture per se. But the Lord's return that's supposed to be the encouragement. 
I feel like the rapture has become a very man-centered gospel. It has become this means of escaping punishment. God loves me so much he would never let me suffer. And therefore, before trouble, tribulation comes, I'm going to be taken out. I just don't see that in scripture anywhere. I don't see it as an example of the past. I don't see it as an example in the future. I don't see it as an example of anything happening right now because there are Christians all over the world that are suffering, persecuting, uh, being persecuted because of their faith, literally uh, being beaten and killed because they are Christians. So what do you say to those people? Well, too bad you missed the rapture. Too bad you couldn't wait for the rapture. It was never God's intent that we escape persecution. As a matter of fact, he promised because they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. But somehow this doctrine, and I think that the how is because our flesh loves to be appeased. We love to have an idea, well, I'm not going to suffer. The rapture is going to take place and save me from it. The encouragement isn't that, oh, you're going to be spared. The encouragement is the Lord's coming back and you're going to be with him forever. Whether you're dead or alive, the Lord's coming back. And that is where our focus is supposed to be. Not using the rapture as a scapegoat of suffering. So remember that as we go through this. This is not an opportunity to not suffer it is an opportunity to be with the lord and as soon as we learn lose focus of that then i think you're going to lose focus of understanding anything about the rapture so with that in mind i want to show you some other verses here for the rapture first corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 and following says listen i tell you a mystery it's a mystery folks you're not going to understand it all we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your uh, sting? Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? So that's really quoting Hosea there. But notice that there's going to be a change. But when? It says, at the last trumpet. That's why I've always kind of understood in Revelation there, there seems to be something going on at the last trumpet. We talked about that when we read it in Revelation there in chapter 7 or 11. We saw that at the last trumpet, right after that blows, it says that the time to reward his saints has come, that the kingdom of this world has now become the kingdom of God. It almost sounds like you're going to be living with God in his kingdom forever. And the time to reward the saints happens at that seventh trumpet. So after the seventh trumpet takes place, what happens next? Well, remember you have the seals, then the trumpets, then the bowl judgments. The bowl judgments is where we are at as we're studying Revelation. We just finished chapter 14. Chapters 15 and 16 are going to now be in those bowl judgments. I'm telling you, you will not be here for those bowl judgments. The seventh trumpet has occurred. And the wrath of God is about to be poured out. And you, man, Christians, are not appointed to wrath. We've touched on that before. But nonetheless, there is something connected here to this trumpet. Now, in this verse, the key as well is death is being overcome. It isn't being delivered from suffering. It's, hey, death, death has no power over you. You will live forever. You have eternal life because of Yeshua. And that is the key to these verses as well. Not being spared from trouble, but being spared from an eternal death, having eternal life. So if I would sum up what the rapture 
is all about with those few verses that we have that really talk about it. You can see that we are caught up together. You can see that the Lord is going to come down from heaven at this point. Remember when they watched Yeshua ascend, he also, he says, he's going to come back in the same way in the clouds. And you're going to see verses that will say that as well. You also are going to see the dead go up first. I think that when Jesus, Yeshua died on the cross, it says at the resurrection, remember the graves opened up. Matthew 27 talks about this. And there were people who came up out of their graves and appeared to their family in town. I think it's a picture of that. At the resurrection, the dead come first. Then you go and you meet the Lord in the clouds where you'll be with the Lord forever. It's going to take just an instant, a flash in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, mortal becomes immortal, perishable becomes imperishable, and death is destroyed. Those are the facts, biblically, that are going to take place at this time. Anything beyond that is just speculation. How all of this happens, don't know. When? Seventh trumpet, at the last trumpet. Luke 17, often I think is misunderstood as a rapture verse. It says, I tell you on the night, on that night, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken and the other left. So here the Lord is saying, hey, there's a day coming. All of a sudden, you're going to be working out in the field. Boom, one's gone. See, it's a rapture. Well, I hope not, because while it may be connected to it, that's not the rapture. Because the disciples ask him, they ask Yeshua, where, Lord? Where? Where are they taken, Lord? And he replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. The one that's taken seems to be taken to be punished. I don't know if it's they're taken and dropped down into the valley of Jezreel or where it is. All I know is that they're taken for the vultures to eat them up. Now, we read in Revelation 19, this very thing seems to be talked about. It says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair. Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. So it seems to be the ones that are taken are taken for judgment. Not to be spared from evil, not to be you know, uh, rescued from any suffering of any sort. So, an important distinction. In this case, it seems it would be better to be left behind. Right? The opposite of the rapture. So, I think Luke is referring to the day of judgment here. Like I said, it may be connected to the time of the rapture, but it's not the rapture itself. Now, another problem with our traditional view of the rapture is that whatever we believe about it, what the New Testament says about it, has to align with the Old Testament. If I take the New Testament and I look at those verses in Corinthians and Thessalonians that we just looked at, where in the Old Testament can you find a single verse backing that up? There's nothing. Nothing. Now, we've been studying here for a lot of years together, and you've seen that in every case in the New Testament, they're quoting the Old Testament, they quote the Torah, and they see, oh yeah, that it was predicted that the circumcision of the flesh would become a circumcision of the heart. Deuteronomy talks about it. Jeremiah talks about it. We, it's not a surprise. But now all of a sudden, this idea of the rapture, one day we're going along and boom, we're gone and we're in heaven and it's all over. Where is that? Well, some will say, oh, uh, Enoch. 
Enoch in the Old Testament, we, we saw him, you know, he walked with God and then he was no more. Well, that's reading a lot into that. Noah, Noah was spared. He was put in the boat and spared while judgment took place. That's a picture of the rapture. I don't know because Noah got off of the boat and then he gets drunk because it's awful. He wasn't spared from suffering. He, his life was spared. Lot. Lot was taken out of the city before judgment took place. Those are the kinds of things that this traditional view of the rapture, those are the arguments for it from the Old Testament. Well, that doesn't sound like Thessalonians. It doesn't sound like Corinthians. So, Ultimately, our view of the rapture today comes only from modern day theology, not from scripture. Something in the Old Testament must explain these verses. And that's what I want to look at here tonight. Yes, I do believe Enoch, Lot, and Noah are examples of God's deliverance, but they don't directly fit the rapture. So let's look at the Old Testament and see what it does tell us about this and see if it connects to Thessalonians and Corinthians so that the old and new become one book, not all of a sudden the new getting to change the rules on us. <clears throat> Moses said that if Israel would not obey God, if they did not keep his commands and decrees, God was going to do the following here in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 64. God would scatter you among all nations from one end of the earth to the other. And he did. We remember in about 722 BC, Assyria came and took the tw 10 northern tribes of Israel and scattered them throughout the world. Babylon later took the southern kingdom to Babylon and some of them came back, others remained and got scattered. But we also read in Deuteronomy chapter 30, a few chapters later, a couple of chapters later, it says in verse 2 and following, when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens. From there, the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. Isn't that interesting? Even to this day, the Jews are scattered. Christians, too, as far as that goes. We're scattered all over the earth. We haven't been gathered together yet. Not at all. But here's this promise. You disobey, you're going to get scattered, but... When you realize you've been wrong and you begin to obey and you begin to follow because you have a heart for me, then I'm going to bring you back and I'm going to gather you to be one. Now, we've looked at many verses in past studies talking about the stick of Ephraim and the stick of Judah, how they're going to become one in God's hands, how he's going to unite the 12 tribes back again someday the ten tribes that were lost. Remember, Yeshua said, I have come only for the lost sheep of Israel. His goal is to bring them back. And we still haven't seen it to this very day. In Judaism, there is a prayer that is actually quite biblical. They're supposed to say this three times a day. It says, blast the great shofar for our freedom. Lift a banner to gather our exiles and gather us together from the four corners of the earth. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gathers in the scattered ones of his people Israel. They're supposed to pray this all the time. In the heart of hearts, they're supposed to be saying, you know, looking for a banner to be lifted that's going to bring back all 12 tribes into one again. And not just 12 tribes, but foreigners and aliens among them as well, as you'll see. Now, just take this in for a moment. Gather a banner raised to gather the exiles from the four corners because 
This is very scriptural. This isn't stuff they're just making up. Isaiah eleven twelve says he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. That sounds just like that prayer. Jeremiah 23, verse 3. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture. Ezekiel eleven seventeen. I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you back the land of Israel again. Now, so often I think we attach this to the Jewish people only. And we say, ah, remember 1948, here in Ezekiel, it says, I will give you the, back the land of Israel again. In 1948, Israel became a nation once again. It is God fulfilling this promise. Now, I do believe to some extent there is truth to that. I'm not saying that that isn't part of it, but that's certainly not all of it. Do you know that even to this day, Israel does not own all the land that God gave to Abraham? Quite a bit of it is missing. Still controlled by either Egypt or Syria. So it's not fulfilled yet. We have this tendency to only attach it to the Jews because there's the Jews and then there's these Christians over here. And though these promises are for the Jews and their land and whatnot. I want you to get that out of your head because it's not just their land, it's your land. Because you are the ones that have been grafted in to the promise of Abraham. Remember what Yeshua said about who the children of Abraham are? The Pharisees, the Jewish DNA, um, you know, Jewish blooded people were not considered Jews by Jesus. He says, your father is the, the devil. If you were children of Abraham, you would do what Abraham did. You'd obey me. So who are those that are of the faith of Abraham? Those who do. Those who follow. Who keep the commands of God and his decrees. Now nobody can do that perfectly, but they have a heart to keep them. They are the children of Abraham. That, those aren't my words. That's scripture saying that. If you love me, you'll do what I say. If you say you know me, but you continue to sin, ultimately, then you deceive yourself. These promises you must incorporate into your theology because these promises of being brought back to the land belong to you as soon as you are grafted into God's people, as Romans says. We are part of this. And frankly, I kind of think that's why when I go to Jerusalem, I feel like I got home. And no other place on earth makes me feel that way, except for maybe my home right here. I hate traveling. And I go to Jerusalem, and I'm home. There's this weird feeling that I cannot explain, and I think it's because God has put it in my heart. It's my land. It's your land. I think there's a song like that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Isaiah even connects the return of the land of Israel to the sound of a shofar. He says this in Isaiah 27. O Israelites will be gathered up one by one. And in that day... A great trumpet will sound. Those who were perishing in Assyria and those who were exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Now we're starting to get some connections to Thessalonians and Corinthians at the sound of the last trumpet in a flash. You're going to be changed. You're going to be gathered. Ezekiel 37 also ties this second coming of the Messiah together with an ingathering. It says this, in verse 12, I think, and maybe 11, I'm not sure where this starts. I will 
or verse 21, Ezekiel 37, 21. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. They will be my people and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob. Verse 12 links it back to the resurrection of the dead. This has not happened yet. Even when they got back to their land from Babylon. I mean, if you've done Seder meals with me, you know how they have an egg and all of these things on the Seder plate, right? Well, those were things that got back to Babylon. They brought back Babylonian culture with them. They have not been able to get rid of the Babylonian culture, especially in Judaism today. This is a future time when King David, who had been dead a long time ago when this was written, is going to be their king. This gathering sounds just like what our doctrine of the rapture is like, except for we're not taken to heaven and it's all over, but we're taken to our land, the land of Jerusalem, doesn't it? where there will be one king, David. It almost sounds like that millennial thing going on in Revelation chapter 20, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I don't know. You'll have to ask her. Are you okay with David being king? <laughs> so something's different with what the Old Testament is talking about versus what we have in our mind from the New Testament. In Jewish eschatology, their, their understanding of end times, they always link the coming of their Mashiach, Messiah, with the final redemption. This is one reason why they had such a hard time seeing Yeshua as Mashiach, because they didn't see him as a suffering servant. They saw the Messiah coming once, not Messiah coming twice. Matthew 24 shows us that the Messiah will be gathering Israel from the four corners of the earth, just like these verses have been telling us. He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This gathering seems to be a rapture. Where is this word rapture? Actually, did you know the word rapture is technically not in Scripture? It comes from the Latin Vulgate, their translation of simply being caught up. So I know some people will ask you, do you believe in the rapture? Well, you better. Everybody better believe in the rapture. What they really mean is, do you believe in a pre-trib rapture? That's kind of, but rapture has kind of become that, pre-trib so many denominations, so many Christian uh, authors and radio hosts are pre-trib rapture people. Well, yes, even those who don't believe in a pre-trib rapture believe in a rapture, being caught up somewhere to the Lord. Go ahead. Yeah. So it's, it comes down to a definition. What is your definition of rapture? And we must get it from what Scripture says. And what I'm getting is it's a gathering. We're seeing a banner being raised. We're seeing gathering from the four quarters of the earth. We're seeing going to Jerusalem, Mount Zion. We're seeing being with the Lord. Well... I could talk about the different theological views of the rapture, especially how uh, there's been a lot of teachings in the past that say this idea that we have of the rapture today only came about in the 1830s by Darby. 
that he brought it about. I think there have been plenty of people who have found other references to it all the way back to the early church fathers. However, it's not called the rapture. It's not necessarily what we see. It's more of this imminent return of God. So part of the idea is that, that people like about the rapture is that we don't know when it's going to happen. It could be tomorrow. It, it could be in like the next three seconds. Boom. Nope, we missed it. Okay. We just don't know. It's going to be such a, an imminent return. But I don't see scripture saying it that way either. I see he says, yeah, you don't know the day or the hour. But he says, you guys know how to, to read the weather. How is it that you can't understand the times? That there are signs of the Lord coming. So when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. He, he gives us all these signs. So yes, you may not know the exact moment, but you're going to know the season. We talked about Thessalonians before. Oh, he's coming like a thief in the night. Imminent. Uh, but you brothers, be on your guard so that they should not surprise you. It's not imminent. So yes, he's coming, but the point isn't as at any moment in time. But at a specific predestined period of time. And you are going to have clues to the season. So I really don't care where the, what the history of the rapture doctrine is. Even if you could, which I don't think you can trace it back to the early church fathers the way we understand it today, but even if you could. Do you know many of the early church fathers believed in Marcionism too? And that was wrong as well. I don't follow early church fathers. I follow scripture. Because Paul even warned, as soon as I leave you, there are going to be savage wolves that are going to come among you, distorting the truth. So Paul says, listen, as soon as I'm gone, even, as there is now, there's going to be false doctrine. So I could trace it back to the early church fathers. It doesn't matter. What matters is what does Scripture say about it? Well, we've just finished chapter 14 of Revelation, and this is what we read. And I think this is very closely connected to what we see in the Old Testament understanding, as well as the New, of a Jewish understanding of the rapture. There before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man. Remember? How was Jesus coming back? On a cloud. With a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand, then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. So first you see godly almost, right? But there's three. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven. He too had a sharp sickle. Still another. Three sickles. I don't know if it's the dead in Christ are raised first, then the godly, then the ungodly. Whatever it is, where are they taken? Well, the ones that are specifically mentioned are the ungodly. And they are harvested and set down, gathered to the barn in a sense, or in, you know, to be burned. It is a gathering of the scattered. It is a rapture. And so I think this is going to help us understand when Revelation 14 here is taking place. Probably at the seventh trumpet. How much time there is with the seventh trumpet, between the seventh trumpet blowing and the Bowls being bore, uh, poured out. I don't know. Maybe it could be a week. Maybe it could be a month. Maybe it's almost instantaneous. Maybe it's a few years. I don't know. All I know 
is that the seventh trumpet seems to be associated with this very teaching. And so it's helping you connect the dots a little bit. Um, in summary, what the Jews see is that the rapture is the time when God is going to gather the 12 tribes of Israel back to Israel, back to their own land. It doesn't seem to be a natural moving. It doesn't seem to be like the Zionist, you know, spending millions of dollars to pay for Jews to be flown back to Israel and given a nice basket of fruit and, and an apartment and not a Bible. Now, we've talked about that before. The Zionists, you often see them advertising on TV to help the Jews get back to their land. They do not share the gospel with them once. What is the point? Well, they feel that by they're helping fulfill these prophecies and getting the Jews to come back to their land. I don't think that's the way it's going to be. I think there's going to be a banner that is raised, and I think it's going to be a supernatural thing that is going to get them there. And I don't think it's the Jerusalem that you're thinking about. I think it's going to be a different kind of Jerusalem, one in which the Mount of Olives has been split in two, one on which the Lord stands. The spiritual aspect of it there. Likewise, as I said, Jerusalem of today not being the spiritual Jerusalem that we're reading about here, especially after the seventh trumpet time period here. <clears throat> it's going to be a time wherein King David seems to reign in Jerusalem once again. How that looks, I don't know. But what I'm seeing is that the Old and the New Testament are starting to come together in harmony in saying that when the Lord comes in the clouds, there's going to be a gathering, a catching up, a, be a rapturing to Jerusalem. <clears throat> so, where does that leave you as a Gentile? I've touched on it, but... We have a tendency to read this, as I said, to the Jewish people only. Well, let me just look at a few other verses here showing you that these are promises that you can take to heart. Isaiah 56, 8. The Sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Maybe that's why there's three sickles. Maybe it's the first one for the blood DNA Jews that followed Yeshua. And then the other one is for the aliens and foreigners among them. I don't know. But I will gather still others to them. Isaiah 14, 1, The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Aliens will join them and unite with the house of Jacob. Guys, this is a promise for you right here. The Gentiles have been grafted in to the exact same covenant. And therefore, just as we see in the Old Testament, they are considered God's chosen ones as well in the New Testament. And so when we read about 1 Thessalonians and Corinthians, 1 Corinthians talking about being gathered, we always read that about us. And we forget about the Jews. You read the Old Testament, oh, that's the Jew, and you forget about us. Isn't that silly? You put them together and you see this is about both of us in both the Old and the New. Here's another one, Leviticus 19.34, The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. If this is what God's law said, that the alien had to be treated as a native born Israelite, do you think God is going to treat you not like a native-born born Israelite? No, he's going to treat you as one. It's his laws. Ezekiel 47, 21. You are to distribute this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. They're getting into the promised land. The, the land is being divided up. It says you two are allotted as an inheritance for yourselves and for the aliens who have settled among you. It's your land. 
and who have children, you are to consider them as native-born Israelites along with you. They are to be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. You go into Jerusalem, you're going home. It's your land. That just excites me. Yeah. So all of this along with John 10, 16, Jesus saying, well, first understand, Jesus himself said, first said I came first for the people of Israel. Um, and then he says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will, be, they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. Yeah. Like, that's Jesus himself confirming all of that mindset. Absolutely. One flock, one shepherd. It's not this idea, oh, I'm a Christian, and oh, these are the Jews. No, you're Jews. The Jews are Christians. They were first called Christians at Antioch. And they were Jews. <laughs> so the Jews are Christians, and the Christians are Jews. And those who have rejected Yeshua as their Messiah, they're not Jews. They're not Christian. I don't care if they dress like Jews, speak in Hebrew, you know, do all the weird things. They're not Jews. What makes them a Jew is faith in Yeshua. And what, has, what makes you have faith in Yeshua, or I should say is evidence of faith in Yeshua, is your works, following the commands of God. This isn't rocket science. It's very simple, but for some reason... We have a hard time understanding it. So in Revelation, we're going to be seeing here later on that the New Jerusalem, there are 12 gates. What gate are you going to enter into? Because you see, you camp around the gates. Well, you're going to go through the gate that your tribal gate that God is going to assign you to. I don't know how that works, but I know he's going to assign you to one. Maybe... He already has, you just don't know it. I just know that you're going to go through one of those gates because you are a native-born Israelite. So it seems that it is possible that the prophets are saying the destination of the raptured ones isn't heaven, but rather the city of Jerusalem, the new, or maybe not the new Jerusalem that comes out of heaven, maybe it is, I don't know, but a place where David's reigning, a place where evil has been cast out of. And then later, the new heavens and the new earth are created. But the rapture doesn't seem to be taking you to heaven. It seems to be taking you to Jerusalem, to the land. Again, maybe that's why it feels like home. It's going to be at this time there will be a change in the flesh. That's what the New Testament tells us in a flash and a twinkling of an eye. Mortal becomes immortal. Okay, it's going to be different. There's no question about that. Deuteronomy 30 says this in verses 5 and 7. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your fathers and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. I love that verse. This whole idea in the New Testament, this Paul, you know, oh, circumcision, we're done with that because now it's circumcision of the heart, so you're not supposed to get circumcised in the flesh anymore. That's, that's old and done with. God never got rid of it. He just said, no, I want you to be circumcised in the heart. Because if you're not circumcised in the heart, I don't care what you are in the flesh. It makes no difference. If you're trying to be circumcised in the flesh because you think that gets you to heaven, that's not going to get you there. You need a circumcised heart. That's what gets you there. And so the whole idea of Paul saying, no, you don't need to be circumcised in the flesh anymore, is biblical from Torah. It was predicted long before. Jeremiah 4.4 even said in the prophets, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you men of Judah and people of Jerusalem. The, the prediction of circumcision would become one of the heart. That's what these verses are saying. 
It wasn't a new law. It wasn't even getting rid of the old law. It was just a completion of it. It's what the old law was pointing to. Now again, many read this as Israel coming back from Babylon, coming back to their land. The Lord's going to bring you back and give you a new heart. They didn't have that in ba- from coming home from Babylon. Some say it was 1948. Look, we still, I mean, granted, there are many Jews coming to know Yeshua as Messiah. I love the, the podcast, One for Israel. If you don't listen to that, you should. There's, that's fantastic. Uh, but their ministry is about outreach and getting Yeshua to the nations of Israel. One for Israel. Okay, I think coming back from Babylon to the promised land, or 1948 bringing them to Israel, these are shadows of the rapture bringing us back. But this time it's going to be so much better. So there's going to be a change in our flesh at that time as well. Romans 2, verse 25 through 29 says, If those who are not circumcised in the flesh keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised in the heart? You see? The flesh counts for nothing. It's the spirit that counts. If you are not circumcised in the flesh, but yet you obey God, that shows that your heart has been circumcised because you have a heart to listen to and to please and to follow after God. That heart change is what this is all about. It goes on, a man is not a Jew if he is one outwardly. Those guys that you see walking down Hastings in, in their you know, black and white garb and their seat seats, those aren't Jews. We always call them the Jews. Hey, saw a Jew today. Right? Did you? <laughs> yeah. Those aren't Jews. You're way more of a Jew because of a circumcised heart. He goes on, he says, No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Ezekiel 36. I'll gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. Give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you. And move you to follow my decrees. And be careful to keep my commands or my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. Praise the Lord for that. What? What? an amazing thing to look forward to for the completion of all of that. Now, in part, you have some of that already. The Spirit lives in you. The Spirit has given you a heart to follow, a heart to desire His commands and His laws. And that's all God wants is your heart. To to say, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to keep your commands. I'm going to fail, but man, I'm going to hate it when I do. I'm going to get back up and I'm going, to, I'm going to search your word. I'm going to put your law in my heart. So again, even in this Romans verse, it's showing that circumcision of the flesh wasn't bad. Okay? I, I mean, which is why we still do it, in part. But without circumcision of the heart for the Lord, the circumcision of the flesh is pointless. I think there are many people in the church who think that they have been circumcised in the flesh and in the heart, but don't have the first clue. It's all a fleshly circumcision because their heart has not changed. It has not been renewed. They don't have a heart to obey God. 
they have a heart for an excuse. Kind of like what we said there at communion. It's a heart to say, hey, I, uh, you know, uh, I'm forgiven, so I can do this. It, it's cheap grace. I can, I can watch pornography. It won't, it won't bother me because I'm forgiven. It's okay. I'll, I'll, you know, I know it's bad and I'm sorry. But, you know, hey, we all sin. And we just keep going back as a pig goes to wallow in, in its mud again. That is not a circumcised heart, folks. If you are justifying your sins, you may want to ask yourself if your heart has been circumcised yet. Jesus is not a justification. He is a solution, but not a justification. In Ezekiel, note as well the alien who has joined Israel. So once again, it's your land as well. And it is that new heart that motivates you to follow the decrees and laws. I just question how much we're seeing um, among that, in, or among Christianity today. A heart to follow God's decrees and laws. I think that in summary, that's what the rapture is. It is a gathering of those who have a heart for Jesus, a heart for Yeshua, and bringing them to Israel. And now I understand what's going on here in Revelation 14. Now I think I understand what 1 Corinthians and Thessalonians is talking about. It's not this made-up doctrine and philosophy that we've come up with because that's not in the Old Testament. I have given you a small sample. You go take a concordance and search the word gather and scatter and see, I'll bet there's 50 verses that will talk about this very thing. Put in there banner as well. Because you're going to see all kinds of verses talking about God raising a banner and bringing people to Jerusalem. That's the rapture, I think. Well, in closing out tonight, I am going to just do a quick review to kind of keep context. We have finished chapter 14 and we're going to now get into chapters 15 and 16. And I want you to kind of keep you know, the, the context of what we've been looking at. So just a quick review going through the chapters. If you want to turn your Bible to chapter 1 of Revelation, you'll be able to see we're just going to give you what each chapter was about in summary. And hopefully you can see it isn't that complicated. We've been dragging this out a long time because we're taking it slow, but you can look at this in a very short summarized version here. In chapter 1, all it was was an introduction showing who wrote the book, how it you know, came to be from whom John received it, who he was supposed to give it to, and so on. And you saw a description of God, the judge, among the churches, holding the, the angels of those churches in his hands. Pretty simple, an opening. Chapter 2, we shifted back to earth, and you see now the churches. The first chapter was in, up in heaven and God sitting on the throne, the, the spiritual aspect. Now chapter 2 takes you to the physical aspect of those churches. Each church that we went through brought us closer to the present era, the present time, and it seemed to get worse and worse as it went along leading up to the time of Laodicea, the lukewarm church that denied its creator. And sometime then, during those church periods, or at the end of those church periods, is when the courtroom is going to be seated and the seal of the seal judgments are going to be opened up. Chapter 3 continued through those seven churches. So chapter 2 and 3, the seven churches, and there was a description of Jesus attached to each one of those churches fitting that church's need or weakness or sin or whatever it is and it, or an encouragement for that church. Chapter 4 shifted back to heaven. We see the judge again taking his seat. It's like a, a judge coming in to seat on his throne and pass out the verdict. So that's the imagery that you're seeing, a courtroom with the judge and the jury with the elders around him passing judgment on the guilty. Chapter 5, we saw nobody could open the scroll, but thankfully the lamb who had been slain could. And so he is given a scroll. And that scroll, which was like a deed to the earth, 
is going to be opened. And as it is opened, each seal that is broken opens up a little bit more of that scroll. It's like a will, a deed to the earth. God is coming back to take ownership. And as he does, the judgments are being passed out as each guilty verdict is read on those seals. Chapter 6 Describe the sealed judgments as the scrolls are literally opened in that. Chapter 5, it's just more who can open it. And it goes through all this rigmarole of him coming in, taking a seat, getting the scroll, and being ready to open it. Chapter 6 opens those scrolls. And <clears throat> with each scroll opened, as I said, judgment takes place. Chapter 7 was a commercial break. Between the 6th and the 7th of all of these, there's a commercial break, a little interlude. So what we saw happening in this commercial break between the 6th and 7th seal was 144,000 of Jews being sealed. And then after that, you see a great multitude of every nation, language, and tongue also before the throne of God. People who are already delivered, you might say. In chapter 8, we finally see the 7th seal is opened. Well, the seventh of everything just starts the next set of sevens. So when the seventh seal is broken, the seven trumpets are about to sound. And so that's what we see here taking place in chapter 8. In chapter 9, it continues the blowing of the remaining three trumpets, the first four in chapter 8, the remaining three in chapter 9. And we see that these last three are terrible. There are these three woes that inflict great pain and death and injury upon those on the earth. But yet it only affects the ungodly. Chapter 10 is our interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. Another commercial break. And we see Christ coming not to judge but to claim ownership where his foot stands on the earth and the sea. And so he's claiming ownership. The scroll is now open, judgment has been passed, and he's saying, look, I own this. Chapter 11, continuing in our little commercial break, we see the two witnesses, probably Moses and Elijah, and probably taking place during the tribulation period. It might cover all seven years, I don't know. But we know the first three and a half years seem to be marked by the preaching of repentance by these two witnesses. The next three and a half years are going to be under the rule of the Antichrist and great persecution. The second part of chapter 11 is when the seventh trumpet finally is opened. And at this point, all believers go to heaven. And we see the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God. So at the end of those seven years... After the two witnesses. And now it seems that what we read in chapter 14 has taken place somewhere in here. Just don't know where. Chapter 12, rewound. It hit the rewind button. It took a quick preview approach to all of history from Satan's fall all the way to the birth of Christ. And the, you know Satan going after the saints. We see the description of the evil trinity moving into chapter 13 as well, where you have the dragon in chapter 12 and then the false prophet, uh, the antichrist and the, and the false holy spirit. Um, the false prophet and the false Christ, the antichrist. So <clears throat> 12 and 13 are primarily focused on that. Satan's ruling and kingdom and, and what he is doing and going after the saints and all of that. And from that yuck, it goes to chapter 14 and it changes to the focus in heaven showing all those who had overcome the beast and the image. And we see the seventh trumpet there, the harvest being taken place, the sickle going in, harvesting the believers Harvesting the ungodly, setting them down for the wrath of God to be poured out. And then in chapter 15 and 16, where we're going next, that is exactly what you're going to see, is the wrath of God and the bold judgments. We're already in heaven. We're gone. It's over for you. Well, you might be in Jerusalem, 
but you will have none of this. And I don't know, you know, what things are like, but it's not what we're going to go see now. It's not the Jerusalem, the physical of this world that we see now. So, but the wrath, the bold judgments, you are not going to see that. You only get to read about it, thankfully. So that is a summary of what we've looked at there. And just a little bit more detail there on the rapture, because I think that really ties in with chapter 14. So we'll close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your promises. We thank you for just taking us back to the land someday. God, you tell us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So few of us really do that. And I think that it isn't just about praying for the land that we have now and their borders, but praying that your people would come to know you. And that is how peace will come to the land. So we pray, Lord, that the eyes of the Jews and all the even Gentiles, Lord, would be open to know that you are their savior. You are their creator. And you are their judge. And without your mercy, your grace, your son, your blood shed on that cross, there would be an awful judgment to pay. Thank you for taking that punishment for us. Thank you for providing a home. Because Lord, this is not home. And I, for one, look forward to getting home. So, Lord, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come and get us home. In Yeshua's name, amen.